KBN TV, the finest television. Watch State of the Nation, a top flight show that dissects how decisions made by those in power affects the ordinary Zambian. Every Thursday at 20 hours on KBN TV, channel 279 on DSTV. KBN TV, the finest television. Watch State of the Nation, a top flight show that is... A very, very good evening to all of you, our dear, distinguished uh, viewers, wherever you may be watching us from. This is State of the Nation on KBN TV. We are live on channel 102 on the Top Star Bouquet. And of course, we are live on DSTV as channel 279. And of course, we have also alternative platforms where you can catch us. Go to KBN TV page on Facebook and join the conversation. Tonight on the State of the Nation, we are discussing one of the things that is on the lips of every Zambian. The health sector in distress. So we'll be looking at the Zambia's health care you know, system and what is happening in there. Some people are saying the health system in Zambia has collapsed. To help us delve into this very uh, contentious issue is um, Dr. Brian Sampa, who is the Resident Doctors Association president he is no stranger to the platform and so we are happy to welcome him back to state of the nation dr sampa it's been quite a while and welcome to state of the nation thank you very much Mr. Mambe. It's, been long. it's been long indeed how are you doing i'm fine wonderful it's good to see you now uh, the health sector in distress that's what most people are saying and other people are saying it's doom it has collapsed so we are hearing a lot of complaints you know regarding shortages of medicine and other essentials in hospitals uh, clinics and health posts from where you stand i mean as a stakeholder within the health sector and providing you know uh, oversight you know um, as far as doctors are concerned in our nation how bad is the situation well um i'll try and put it very simple firstly when you look at our health care system uh, it's made up of different levels so we are talking about at community level where we've got community uh, health posts and then from there we move to uh, you know the uh, the centers now the community health centers. From the centers now we go to district hospitals, general hospitals, then we go to central hospitals, then teaching hospitals. Now these were made in this way to ensure that at each level the service delivery is as close to the people as possible, and also to kind of stage the management so that. At that community level, when there's a community health worker who is helping, there are things that they can do and things that they can't do. That which they can't do can be handled at the center. Then from the center, it goes to the hospital. So as this is being done, you are cutting down on the congestions in the higher hospitals, and then you are also helping to ensure that the people get quality health services. Now, what comprises of quality health services? It starts with the human resource. So when you talk about human resource, we are talking about the people who are supposed to carry out these duties in the hospitals. Do we have enough in Zambia? The answer is no. Currently, you go to rural areas, you find these centers have no nurses, they have got no clinic officers, they are being manned by community health care workers and just community health care assistants. These are people who are running these facilities. Where they are lucky, they may have one nurse, the entire, you know, facility. And then you find the entire district has got one clinic officer. To make matters worse, some districts don't even have a single doctor. They don't have a single pharmacist, no radiotherapist, nothing. So we are lacking in human resource. From human resource, we come to medicines and medical supplies. In that area, we are actually doing the worst because... If I recall, very, uh, as early as 2018, yes, we started having some shortages. However, the kind of shortages we were having then, even last year, were not as bad as it is right now. 
In the past, for example, a mother would go to the hospital. When they go to the hospital, they are supposed to be told, for you to come and deliver here, you need to come with a bucket, and you may have to buy the surgical gloves. But this time around, they have also added that these mothers now need to go with syringes, they need to go with needles, and if possible, they may even need to go with IV fluids just in case that there is an emergency. To make also things even bad, as if they are not even bad already, there are no sutures in hospitals. So people are being referred for simple things like just suturing a tear. A mother is from delivering, they are bleeding, they have to be moved from a health center to a hospital, something which could have been done just at the center. So when you talk about the quality of the services we are delivering now, we are really in danger and things have deteriorated to a level where people are even shunning hospitals because simple things like antenatal, where people have to go, the mothers, and just get iron, simple iron, they can't find it. So people are shunning hospitals, and that's a challenge we're having. It cannot get any worse than that. I think you are painting a very scary and gloomy picture where the scarcity of human resource, and now there's absolutely no medical supply. Is it the complexity of the healthy you know, infrastructure uh, across the country. What do you think um, is, 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 is leading to this? Is, is it lack of funding? Is it lack of leadership? Is it uh, lack of procurement and procurement flaws? How can we end up in such a bad and gloomy picture that you are just painting? So, firstly, to understand what's happening, we need to go back to how do we procure these drugs? Of course, it involves, in Zambia here, there's a specific statutory body, which is ZAMSA, which is supposed to procure drugs. ZAMSA is under the Minister of Health, and they report directly to the Minister of Health. Now, for them to procure drugs, they need money. And we were lucky, actually, in this budget, this budget had more than 3.3 billion kwacha allocated for procurement of drugs and medical supplies. This is something which has never happened before. But so, allocation and actual displacement are two different. So what are we talking so about? Finish. So what happened is there was that allocation of 3.3 billion in this budget. So we were waiting that maybe because by December, September, October there, there were so many shortages. We thought maybe it's because the budget hasn't yet started working. We waited for January. January came some money was released, about 400 million kwacha. In March, again, money was released. In April, and even in latest, it was May. So the total amount of money which has been released is about 1.9 billion kwacha from the 3.3 billion. And those facts are there even on the Ministry of Finance page. And they were even announcing even in Parliament. But the question is, despite releasing these monies, why are we still having shortages? The question is, where is the money? The thing is, they said they released the 1.9 billion up to now. That's how much they have released. So if that money was released and we are having shortages, where has the money been taken to? Let me, let me ask you a question really uh, on that, Dr. Sampa. I think we have seen that um, it is one thing for the government to announce that they've released. It's another to actually authenticate that that money has been released. Take, uh, yesterday, I was hosting someone here and they, they raised an issue of retirees where the president even on his facebook page said today we have released so much for retirees retirees are not receiving any money would it be then a question of just the government making a pronouncement but there is no money that has been released because i don't see any you know reasonable proc procurement officer or any reasonable uh controlling officer in the ministry of health knowing fully well that there are no medicines in these facilities would be sitting on 1.9 billion that you're talking about for sure we must you be know, missing something here for sure it is very unfortunate you know we've been asking ourselves this question now when we listen to the utterances by the minister it also raises more questions look when the minister goes to these facilities the question she asks is where do you take the money we pay you we send for medis for medicine now that is very disappointing coming from the minister because one we've had money has been released now we hear someone condemning the facilities that you are not buying drugs that is showing that the minister may not understand who really is supposed to buy those drugs or she's doing it deliberately while knowing that they are no there is no money for drugs 
Because if the minister talks about procurement of drugs in terms of people using the grant which they receive per month, then she's very wrong. Because procurement of drugs is done centrally and then distributed to facilities. Yes, hospitals receive grants. But let's take for instance, let's look at the actual grants. How much do they receive? Here in Lusaka, there's one hospital I won't mention. It receives only 114,000 kwacha per month. That's a big hospital, catering for a community of more than 200. Why wouldn't you want to mention it? People are interested in knowing. Because those are issues, if you, if, if you keep masking them, help will never go to that facility. The reason why, um, you know, it's a general picture everywhere. But I wouldn't want to mention the hospital for purposes uh, of just confidentiality. However, that 114,000 which, which is given to that hospital per month is supposed to be used for fuel. That same amount is supposed to be used for buying cleaning materials. And if there are any meetings, the management for that hospital are supposed to use the same money. And from that money, 30% is supposed to be used for the procurement of uh, you know, those emergency drugs. Now, 30% of 114,000 is less than 40,000. So if you look at that, how many drugs can you buy and what can you actually buy in 30,000 kwacha? Nothing. Even if we were to say, let them use the entire 114,000, those drugs can't even last a day. So the monies which are given to these facilities are so little for them to even manage to do anything with it. So the minister can't go and blame them that they are not buying drugs. So we remove that reason. So now we are remaining with the money, which has been mentioned that it keeps coming out, and yet it's, there is no procurement happening. Early this year, we heard that the board for Zamsa had traveled to Egypt. From Egypt, they went to South Africa. Now, those are the wrong things which are being done, because Zamsa board has got no role to play when it comes to procurement of drugs. They are not supposed to have an active role in that. For them, their job is just to provide oversight, they appoint the CEO, and the CEO would run all the affairs of that institution. It's ZAMSA which is supposed to advertise, and then later, people are supposed to apply. Now, we have a challenge, because we've seen active involvement of the board, even the minister saying, we are going to be procuring drugs from Egypt, which is so wrong. The minister does not have a role to play in procurement of drugs. It's ZAMSA which is supposed to do that. Now, where we have a problem from what we've gathered so far is because of adding politics to the Minister of Health. What we mean by that is this. When the new government came into office, everyone who was supplying drugs before this government came into power was cut off, being considered as part of the previous regime. Now that is a problem. Zambia has got limited number of suppliers. And those suppliers are the same suppliers who've been used during the MMD, they were used during the PF, and they can still be used as long as they are credible mm -hmm. and they are providing quality medicines. It's not like we've always had these scandals like the honeybee scandal we had, no. And that was specific for honeybee, but we've had other pharmace pharmaceutical companies which have been able to actually provide these services with quality drugs. So why do we have to even go to Egypt or South Africa? Have we run out of options in Zambia? The answer is no. But the problem is politi politicization of the Minister of Health, where everyone, whoever did anything previously, is being considered as an enemy of the new government, which is, supposed, which is not supposed to be the case. Because people, suppliers, and all these people are working in government are loyal to the government of the day. Every supplier wants to be in good boots with the government of that day so that they are given those contracts. Do we have, you know, if they suspended the previous suppliers, do we have a whole new, you know, list of suppliers that have been contracted now to fill the gap? Or now it is completely blank and we do not know how disruptive the, the, the supply chain has, has, has become now? The only thing we've heard so far, firstly, somewhere in March, the government actually said that they had not procured drugs and they accepted for the first time. Then moving forward, they came and said, no, it's because it's a tedious process. You know, these drugs are coming from far. They started saying a lot of things. And one of the notable things which has been mentioned is the issue of fighting corruption mm -hmm. and wanting to be methodical, ensuring that they seal all those gaps so that people don't steal and there is no corruption in the procurement of drugs. But to what extent can we delay? Because when you are dealing with the Minister of Health, 
time is of, of utmost importance. When you are dealing with human life, you are not just looking at the gain and the loss. You are also looking at that individual and how much time they have for them to survive. The longer we wait, the more people are dying. I'll cite an example. You go to Cancer Disease Hospital today. Somebody who may have had a cycle of chemotherapy or somebody who may have had some treatment in January and they don't have it. This is June. That cancer would have spread to, to a stage where maybe that person may not even be able to survive. If somebody had syphilis in January and then they don't have the benzathine penicillin to give them, by now that syphilis would have become a tertiary disease and at that level it is very complicated. So diseases advance with time. So we can't continue doing this chit chat and trying to give reasons while as people are dying. Just because we don't parade ourselves on TV to start announcing how many deaths, how many people are sick of malaria today, how many people are sick of syphilis and what, we just talk about COVID. We tend to think COVID is the biggest problem we have right now, when in the actual sense it's not. We have bigger problems and we have got more diseases which are killing more people. If you look at the statistics, even maternal deaths have gone up. And right now as we speak, things are getting worse day by day. But for how long are we going to take? Even if we come and, pr and provide the medication next month or another month, we will provide for those who will be alive at that time. We are not going to bring back those who are already dead. So Ministry of Health has to be handled with care. It's not like any other ministry where you can starve people for some time, then bring those commodities later. you find them. So it's very difficult at this point in time if we are seeing the way people are handling the Ministry of Health like it's just any other ministry. It's worrisome. I mean, hearing you speak like this, and I believe you, you are representing all the doctors across um, the country and all the health workers across the country who might not have the you know the privilege uh, that the, the 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 position you occupy you know gives you you have the privilege to speak and um, if what you are saying is the true picture then i would like to believe that even the membership your membership must be very demoralized having the passion to attend to workers i mean to to patients but having no means of you know, answering to, to the critical health, you know, uh, conditions that people are, are, coming, uh, are coming with. What, what, what is your membership saying? So, you know, when we listen to our membership, it's a sad thing. Just last week, we had at Kanyama Level 1 Hospital, there was someone who went there and he had to post on media. He found people are working without gloves. Now, imagine you are dealing with a lot of diseases. This is, 20, tw this is 2022, and then there are different diseases. Some diseases can just be transmitted by touch. And now people are working without gloves. Some people have to provide their own gloves. It's very dangerous for the healthcare workers, not only the doctors, the nurses, and all other people. For the nurses, it's even more dangerous because they are always tending to these patients. They are the ones who are in touch, in close contact with these patients. How are they managing to work? People don't even have cotton wool in some facilities. Simple cotton, they don't have syringes. So somebody comes, they're very sick, you need to tell them to go and buy syringes. But look at the socioeconomic status of our people. How many people are capable of buying drugs? How many people are capable of buying all those things which are needed if they have to go to theater? They are very few. So it's really a challenge and people are seeking to do now things they are not supposed to do. They are seeking help elsewhere in places where normally they couldn't go. <laughs> so now, I mean, talking about, you know, something that was posted on, on social media from uh, Kanyama. I know also yesterday someone uh, who is my friend on, on, on Facebook posted a prescription and a syringe that he was just from buying and saying, I am from buying this syringe so that I can go and get an injection because at the hospital where he went yesterday, and this is here in Lusaka, they had no syringes. They had to send the patient to go and buy a syringe from a chemist somewhere and drive back to the hospital so that he can receive an injection. How is this impacting an average Zambian who finds themselves in such a situation? And I'm depicting perhaps a typical rural area where a doctor says, go and bring your own syringes. Where will the poor 
you know, woman, man get the syringe from? You know, that example you've given, in urban areas, it's even better. You know, in rural areas, you find where the facility is, it's maybe 20, 30 kilometers from the bomber. And these people literally walk and they spend hours to go to that facility. So if they go and find that those commodities are not there, it's practically impossible actually for them to go and find an alternative. The bad part about rural areas, they don't even have the private pharmacies. So they depend on the government to provide everything. So whenever there is a shortage, it means people have got no other option. Mm. Others have to sleep over and go the following day. Now, that is very dangerous because depending on the disease somebody has, yeah. some diseases can wait, some can't wait. So we need to put everything into context mm. as we are dealing with human life. Mm. Just because here in Lusaka, we even have an opportunity to go to private facilities to also go and buy medication. It doesn't mean everyone can manage. Mm. And what is worse is that as these people are working, yeah. these very committed healthcare workers in rural areas, they are working day and night but without enough supplies. Sometimes they are being forced to give money to these patients mm. to go and buy medicine because they understand the dangers of the diseases those patients may have. Right. And then we come out here now, people going on media and parading some people to say we've got drugs and we've got 80%, which is not true. Why should we lie? Why can't we just come out honest and speak out when things are wrong? The one thing that we've noticed is that when anything else comes, there is diversion, you know. The ministry is trying to divert the attention of people. For instance, the issue that happened last time at Matero Level 1, there, just to find a toilet which was not in good shape, the entire management was shaken, people reshuffled and transferred. But look, that is just a tip of an iceberg. The problems we are having are more than that. And when you look at that problem, that was not the solution. Because when you find a toilet which is buggered, the, th the first thing you ask yourself, do these people have enough money to repair this? If they do, why is the toilet dirty right now? Could it be that this hospital does not have water 24-7? You look at these hospitals. Most of them, they don't have running water 24-7. Even the other week, somebody complained about UTH. They went there. There was no water the entire day. So the minister does not have the capacity to identify problems. And the things that she's looking at as very important are not the important things. The most important things are being overlooked. Like uh, a month ago, a month ago we had uh, the reshuffles where all the provincial health directors were demoted. These provincial health directors who were demoted and sent to districts, their districts where they were sent, they are already district health directors. So what did they do? They had to put now two district health directors. They created another position for a district health director for technical services, the other one for administrative services. Now, you come to think of it, do we really need that kind of service at a district level? No, we don't have doctors in hospitals. We are crying for employment of other healthcare workers. But meanwhile, are, yeah. those, are those positions going to be filled or they, 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 they've just decided that we need, we need to restructure? What, what, what's the rationale? So that's where the problem is. You know, when you are dealing with uh, human life, like we've always said, you even in especially in the Ministry of Health, we have got indicators. Each province, district is gauged by how they are performing. Even the appraisals are done in that way. If somebody is hardworking, you are going to look at the indicators. If you have to demote somebody, you are going to look at the indicators. This person is not been performing. But I'll cite an example of Rapla province. Rapla province was one of the best performing provinces in maternal health. They would record zero deaths the entire time. And then now, even there, the provincial director was demoted. So what rationale was being followed? And is it possible that all the provinces in Zambia were performing poorly, that all the provincial directors should be demoted and replaced? Are, are you saying these are political or irrational decisions? that are These are very irrational decisions, and these are decisions which are being made by people who are using a political lens because for them anybody who served in a high position last year is being considered as being from the other regime now that's a problem because civil servants rise in ranks most of these provincial directors they were dhds in mmd they were district directors they performed well then they were appraised 
and now they became provincial directors. Others were our teachers at UTH. They were consultants before they were promoted. These are people who saved the ministry. And then just because last year there was another regime which may have done certain wrong things, then they are also supposed to go with that regime. They just happened to save under that. The same way this regime will pass, does it mean everyone who has ever been appraised will be sent away immediately this government also is changed? So that is wrong. We need to uphold the civil service and protect the civil service. The way the civil service is now, it's being destroyed. Firstly, we've got politicians being appointed to the civil service. Secondly, we've got now the civil service being turned into political appointments where you find people who are loyal are being appointed as long as they are loyal to the party those who are not who, who are not loyal whether they are good whether they can perform they are not being looked at which is so sad because now all these people who've been demoted these people are demotivated they were the mentors one of the aspects of the sustainable development goal number three is to it talks about also mentorship as one of the things that can help us to achieve universal health coverage. Now, these were the mentors who've been turned into mentees. Because if you are the provincial health director, then you are demoted to the district health director. What's the motivation there? And you know you were doing everything within your capacity to perform. Those were not politicians. They were supposed to be spared. Well, very, very sad uh, situation there. You're watching State of the Nation and we're discussing the health sector in distress. And my guest on the program is Dr. Sampa. Uh, Brian is the uh, Resident Doctors Association president. Painting a very gloomy picture. Now, I need to read for you and our viewers something from my phone that I picked up online. It says, the persistent drug shortages are due to a political experiment that has gone wrong and they say step number one fire all minister of health procurement officers they are pf step number two don't pay any more money owed to drug suppliers they are pf step number three move all drug procurement powers to zamsa but dissolve the entire zamsa board because they are pf and then it says Without procurement officers, without ZAMSA board, drugs cannot be bought and existing suppliers have refused to supply on credit as they are owed. Okay, step number four, Dr. Sampa, constitute a new board but fire the entire ZAMSA management. They are PF. It sounds chaotic. For sure. Is there uh, truth in this? There is some truth in it. And, uh, you know, when you look at what has been happening, these are the things we've been talking about. You know, a good leader should be a team player. And a good leader should be able to identify those who can perform and those who can't. And most importantly, a good leader listens from the technocrats. There is no minister who is a jack of all trades. So as a minister, we expect that a minister is supposed to be there and be advised by the technocrats. The aim of being there is to direct the policy so that now people can know which direction to go but ultimately they're the ones who are supposed to do the right thing are you are you saying that the job that the minister has currently is perhaps above a paycheck maybe it's it's too complex for her are, are you saying she's failing to fit in the shoes of dr chilufia and many other that have gone ahead of her it's it's sad but we need to face the facts you know one thing that we've always believed in is to speak the truth it doesn't matter who hears it and who is hurt by it. You know, we gave the minister more than 10 months to try and prove herself. But what we've seen, she lacks the capacity. And how we know that is because the changes she makes, firstly, don't translate into improvement of the health system. Secondly, the minister has caused more problems than good. From the time the minister came, the drug shortages and medical supplies keeps going down and things keeps getting worse, while she keeps on claiming that things are being done. The other aspect which shows that the minister really lacks capacity is the complaints. You know, as the captain of the ship, you are supposed to be the solution provider. You can't be the whistleblower. You can't be the complainant. She has brought out more problems and brought out no solutions. So it's like she's better at identifying problems but she can't find the solutions to those. So we need somebody who can work on those problems 
and find the solutions. Because ultimately, this year may go just like this. And how many people are going to die? Unfortunately, because the government is the one which is supposed to actually give us the statistics of the deaths. But no government can come out and dent its own image. But people are there to see what is happening. Things are not okay. In inadvertently, you are calling for the dismissal of the Minister of Health. You know, dismissal is not the term. The thing is, ministers can work in other ministries where they can perform better. I'll cite an example here. We don't need to pretend that things are better now in Ministry of Health than the way they were last year. It's a fallacy. I know some people would want to always praise everything that is new, but we are not like that. We've got indicators which we look at. Right now, we are doing very poorly. Even in ARVs, ARVs, the majority of the ARVs are, are supported by PEPFA. And then the Zambian government just, you know, puts in a little bit of effort, but much of it is funded uh, by the Americans and other organizations. Now, when you look at ARVs, in some places, as we speak, they are mm. giving people mm. the ARVs for children, and those are adults. And in some uh, instances, this year in January, in January this year... Uh, that, uh, what are the implications of giving children's ARVs to an adult? What, what are the implications? So the implications are just that the tablets will be more. And now that supply for the children may suffer a little bit. People now have to get frequently than the way they were getting in the past. And then we are also having a challenge. In January, there was even a case in Kawa where somebody was given, it was not, or it was on ARVs, but then they ran out. And for, after some time, they tried to, you know, they entered into another stage. They entered into the aid stage and ended up dying because of lack of ARVs. And we are seeing this in some instances, actually, in most of these facilities, the little drugs you are seeing are being donated. They are just being donated by some organizations like JSI. The other week donated something in Kawe and in other places. So when you look at all these things happening, it means that the system is no longer there because the system is supposed to be self-sustaining and it's supposed to be providing these services. We no longer have that system anymore. And what are we looking at? is fighting the corruption in Ministry of Health this hard that 10 months down the line you can't do anything, you just focus on fighting? No, that is not how we fight. Actually, the best way to fight this corruption is not to disrupt the service delivery. Let service delivery continue and everything should be done. Besides, if we are to translate what was pronounced in the budget, we are supposed to have heaven on health when it comes to the drugs in the in the ministry of health i know your role is not to you know cause you know fear in the lives of zambian people but it would appear to me with based on the picture you're painting we are losing more lives than previously d sure. do we have any statistical indicators so when you look at that that's why i said the problem is the people are supposed to give us the actual statistics at the hospitals it's the government unfortunately they can't do that we have a number of people who've come forth and complained, and we've seen also cases where people have actually died. There are instances where we've moved in even to help some patients who've reached out through Facebook and in other instances where people go to the hospital, they are found with certain diseases, and we know it's a dangerous disease. We have to send them money to buy drugs. We have to advise and do all sorts of things. Our doctors, our nurses, and other, other people, they have been buying drugs for people helping these people, buying them things, because they just can't see those people suffer without helping them. But now these are the people who are also just getting a meager salary, which is not even enough. So it's not fair. It's already impacting on the, the, these people's economies, the microeconomies in their homes. And then because they are trained to help, they are failing to just sit back and relax. I mean, uh, Dr. Sampa, you, you, you are representing a very critical a mass of, of uh, highly qualified uh, individuals, dedicated men uh, and, and women. They may not have the voice, really, but this platform gives you an opportunity. If you were to use this opportunity to escalate, maybe it's to the head of state, what would be your appeal? Because it does sound like a very dire situation we are in uh, as far as the healthy you know, sector is concerned. You know, the only appeal which we would want to make to the president is that, look, the president is not short of people who can manage the Minister of Health. The Minister of Health right now is not in good hands. And where we are going, we are going to catastrophe. So the head of state should move in quickly 
and try to bring in somebody else who can manage to really work on the Minister of Health. There is a lot of problems, and these problems, our minister is not equal to the task. Right. Now, um, recently you brought out something that was very, very sad. Um, you exposed... Um, because, I, I, I mean, many people like now your advocacy role that you have assumed, maybe because you're not uh, in gainful employment, uh, so to speak, which gives you a little bit autonomy, which is good. I must say, uh, you are really helping many people to understand the intricacy and uh, the behind the scenes. Recently, you brought out the issue of um, um, the, the suspension of full blood count service at the university teaching hospital. My question on that is twofold. First of all, suspension of the full blood count at a teaching hospital, a last resort referral point. What is the implication, number one? Number two, what is the current status from that time when this thing was brought to the fore? Has this issue been regarded and treated as agent that it perhaps may have been resolved and taken uh, by, you know, um, it's been take, overtaken by events. What, what is the current status and what are the ramifications if that status has not been corrected? So the implications, you know, for people, um, I'll try to simplify so that they understand what full blood count is. So full blood count is uh, one of the tests which are done. And these are routine tests. When somebody goes to the hospital, they need to remove some blood and check the blood picture. The full blood count, in as, in as much as it is a simple test, can bring out a lot of things. And it is one of the tests which every physician and anyone working in the hospital would want to do before they can do anything. It will give you a general picture. Firstly, if somebody has got anemia, it will show they are just on the full blood count. If somebody has got an infection, it will show. It will also show certain diseases which may be complicated, but from the full blood count, we'll be able to see that, okay, there may be this, there may be that. When you don't have something as simple as a full blood count, somebody can come there in anemia, and you won't be able to identify such a thing if you are not very sharp when you are checking the patient. So a full blood count is very cardinal. You don't, if you go to any hospital, whatever paper you find there where there are a lot of numbers, that's full blood count. They may not do other tests, but full blood count is always done. Now, not doing full blood count could mask a lot of things, and it is very dangerous on the patient. And also, it disadvantages the one who is treating the patient. Because sometimes, if you are giving blood to a patient, you also need to make sure that you start following up. Are they peaking or they are not peaking? There are so many things which we do, to, to, to which we can use the full blood count for. So it's a very important test. And it's something which when you see it missing, because it's a basic one, then you know that things have really gone bad. Right. Now, what we saw there was just a tip of an iceberg. Actually, we were told that in other centers, they have even forgotten about it. It never happens. They are always running out of reagents. That's what we saw, and that's what our people have reported. So things are really bad. But coming to the picture at UTH, immediately it was exposed. At least they had to move a bit and rectify that problem because it came to the public. So yesterday we tried to follow it up and we were told that no, they were doing something, they were working actually on it. That's very good news, but then there was also a fallout, some disciplinary issues came in, you know, whoever may have, you know, leaked that or released that. I think there was some indicators that the, someone was being disciplined. Is that the case? So, you know, firstly, nobody leaked that. You know what people need to understand? When a memo is written, it's put on a notice board. It's there for the people to see. And that memo was meant for the public to say, we have suspended. The clinicians and other people were supposed to know so that they don't draw blood, which is just going to be thrown. What is the essence of drawing blood when you're not going to use it for anything? So what was being done there was not something new. We've seen those things in hospitals every time. There are memos. No, the x-ray machine is down, so don't send patients. No, this machine is not working. Don't do, we are not doing electrolytes. They do that. So it's not something new. But we are talking about people politicizing things. So they looked at it as an embarrassment. And the next thing is those people now had to please the Ministry of Health by coming out that way they did. But even those people were coming out that way. They knew that there was nothing wrong there. 
And we are happy that up to date, at least that issue of disciplinary and other things, we tried to follow it up. Things are still okay. There is no one who is being followed up for, for that. Issue. Right. Now, when we started, Dr. Sampa, one of the critical issues that you raised was this sh critical shortage of um, manpower, both at district, uh, provincial level, as well as at national uh, level. The good news, though, was when the government, uh, the new government came into power, they did promise, you know, additional recruitment of 11,000, you know, 276 health workers in different, you know, categories. But of course, we don't know whether this has been actualized. Uh, it's been mud in some, uh, you know, back and forth and so on and so forth. You are a key, you know, stakeholder and probably very close to the process. What is reaching you? How far are we from actualizing this, you know, uh, ambition of um, recruiting these health workers? You know, the biggest problem we've had with our employment has been lack of openness from the employers and also the issue of not saying the truth. This employment, uh, last year in November, December, the minister had said in January, that's when it's going to come. January came until March, that's when they advertised. Now, when you look at the advert, we expected that within a month, things were going to normalize and people are going to get letters. A month later, they had set a date when people are supposed to get the, the, the letters. That date came and nothing happened. They have set more than four dates and the latest one is next week, which we are waiting for. So we are hoping that this time around, by next week, something should be done. Because the other week, again, the Civil Service Commission said next week, which was last week. So the weeks keep coming and going. But this is not because the employers don't know when they will employ. No. The problem here is they are not just saying the truth about when they were employed. It's either the date is very far and people don't want to say the truth, but they would rather tag people along. Or there's no money. Wait. Or there's no money. You know, we, we, we refuse that there's no money. The reason why we refuse that there's no money, you know, it's all about, you know, the government can always find money if they want to achieve something. It's priorities. Priorities and priorities, that's the most important thing. If the government can prioritize the Ministry of Health, money can always be found. In the recruitment process of the, uh, the teachers, they, 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 there has been this thing that has come up saying locals were not being considered. Is that also something that's happening in the you know, recruitment and uh, you know, enlisting of health workers? Oh, yes. Yesterday. We had uh, something interesting where one of our, our people uh, sent us a letter where, you know, you find that um, the permanent secretary for Western Province had to write a letter to, the, to all the district commissioners. Apparently, the district commissioners complained that uh, they, are, they were disadvantaged in the locals in the selection. So they complained about certain individuals, the district health directors, and then the PS now had to direct them that they specifically write and mention those people so that they can be disciplined before 22nd of this month. Now, that is very wrong. You know, when you look at the teams which were formed, those teams were formed by the Civil Service Commission. In those teams, they were the OP. In those teams, they were the anti-corruption. They were the human resource. There was the DC. There was the district health director and everyone. Why pick on the district health director? Like the district health director sat alone and started selecting people. That is so wrong. There is no district health director today who can even collect any money from someone to say, I'll find you a job. They will be lying because in these meetings, they are not alone. And they are not the ones with the power to select. They are selecting as a team. So all those things were done and names were sent. Now, what they complained about was some people were deemed not to be local on the basis of the names they had as surnames. Now, that is very disturbing because we are living in a country where you can be born anywhere and you can live anywhere. So, using somebody's surname should not di di dictate where they should come from. I may be Sampa, but I'm not born in Muchinga. You may be someone else and you are born in another province. Now, before we even go to that, the other aspect we need to look at is, if we say locals are people who are residing in a certain area, 
What happens to those people who are in districts where there were no positions? It's not like they said each district had 10 positions. No, there were districts where there were no positions at all. So people had to travel to go and apply in other districts. That is how it was. Even when they advertised, they said, apply where you feel you can go. It was not about where you are. If it was where you are, they were supposed to distribute equally in all the districts. So this issue of local, if we don't handle it properly, it is going to bring more confusion. And the issue here, the biggest problem, is because of the involvement of DCs. There was no need to involve the dis district commissioners. They are, poli they are politicians. No, they are politicians. You know, the only thing a district commissioner will use as a gauge for your qualification is your loyalty to the party. The DC is coming from the party. Some of them were people who even stood in certain places. These are politicians. So the only thing they want is their people. And their people are those people who they feel are loyal to the party. Whether they qualify or not, them they would want you to be there. And this thing of saying local is really circumventing the process because every job uh, advert says you must be Zambian, you must possess a green NRC registration card. That's it. The local thing is a little alien. No, it's alien. Because when you look at uh, the, the, the local issue, as long as you are Zambian, you are local. And when you look at the distribution now in Zambia, those things are old. Where you talk, you look at the tribe, where you look at uh, someone's surname, those are old things. I, I am member, my, I'm married to a lousy, beautiful woman. You see. My children, they have both uh, lousy and, and, and Bemba names. Should, should they be disenfranchised because I come from this way but they are living in, 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 in western province? That's the problem. And people are now championing this by saying no because during the PF, uh, you know, some regions were, were discriminated. I don't know where this narrative comes from. Let me give a true picture to the nation so that people can understand. Myself, I was fired by the PF. It was supposed to be presumed that me being Bemba, it meant that I was uh, for PF. So I was supposed to be kept and, uh, you know, I was supposed to rise in the ranks, treated well. You know, that narrative is wrong to think that PF was good to Bembas or it was good to Easterners or it was good to such a sect. No, the, the things which were wrong were wrong to everyone. So there is no one who should feel that now it's their time. It's a Zambian time. It's the time for all the Zambians. The entire country rose and decided to make a change. When they made that change, now it was for everyone to enjoy. So it doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter where you are. You can apply anywhere and work anywhere. That's how it's supposed to be. Such things where people are now even getting scared that they'll be fired and they feel uneasy because they are in a certain place where people seem to just want people from that area should come to an end. Is, is that happening? That is what is happening. So that later, those people were scared. That person even said directly that I may be fired because our names will be submitted. So, so we, we took a step and we informed some authorities to try and see how best they can intervene. And uh, we are still following and we are following it up to see that this thing comes to an end because it's, it's very backward. And we shouldn't tolerate such a thing to happen because people were applying wherever they wanted. To. Please, government, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't fire people because you are taking politics in civil service. Don't do that. Dr. Sampa, the minister's visit to Matero not too long ago found some Nessie on the phone and uh, she went ballistic and called them names and, and, and there's, there was all that hula baru. Um, what do you make of that? You know, I think I even earlier mentioned, firstly, let's understand the hospital setup. When you're in the hospital, a nurse, their job is to be by the bedside, they check the patients when the time is right. For instance, if the patient is supposed to take medication four times in a day, the nurses will be there those four times and they will ensure that the patient gets whatever they need. These nurses are not bedsiders. They are not supposed to be seated by the bedside the entire time. So when the nurse is in a duty room, they are free to be with their phone. Firstly, that phone can be used for research. 
Secondly, the phone can be used to even calculate the drug. Sometimes you find a nurse is done with what she was doing, then she comes back and gets the drug chart, starts calculating the dosages. The nurses do that. If the nurse was found beside a patient with a phone, then the minister would have had the right to shout at her. But the fact that the nurse was in the room, there was no need. Besides, the minister said, patients are waiting outside, you are here. Nurses are not the ones who see patients. The people who see patients, nurses would do the vitals, then they go and sit and start waiting. You may find a long queue, but nurses have done their part. Those people are not waiting for the patient to see them. They are either waiting for a clinician or a medical doctor to see them. Then when they are admitted, again a nurse takes it up. So that is also lack of understanding about how things are done coming from the minister. From where you are sitting, you are seated at a very informed position. What would be your general description of the health system in Zambia today? The only thing I would say here is that it's not in good hands, but we can do better. Zambia is not short of people who can manage the health sector. This is State of the Nation. We discuss policy. If policy is failing, please don't hurt. Dr. Sampa, in your closing remarks, I need to take you back to one thing that you said. You said Zambia is not short of human resource. The health sector is in wrong hands. Is that your personal opinion? Is that the opinion of the Resident Doctors Association? That is the, when I speak as RDZ president, that's the opinion of the association. You are saying she must go. The minister is not fit to be there. Well, it's not me. That's the Resident Doctors Association. Doctor, uh, you know, um, Sampa says, the membership says, Madam Sylvia Masevo is not fit to be the minister of health. And they are requesting for an immediate change. Is that correct? For sure. Your last words. Well, at this point, I just want to appeal to the president. I think most of the things we've talked about. Look, um, one ministry can dent the entire government. And right now, the Minister of Health is doing that job very well. So the president really needs to act quickly because this borders on national security. Thank you very much for joining us on State of the Nation. Be sure to join us yet again on Thursday, 20 hours on your channel of choice, the finest television, KBN TV. We are on Topstar Channel 102 and DSTV Channel 279. Thank you for your company. God bless you and keep you. Bye-bye. how decisions made by those in affects the ordinary Zambian every Thursday at 20 hours on KBN TV channel 279 on DSTV KBN TV the finest television watch State of the Nation a top flight show that dissects how decisions made by those in power